Hey mammals, today we're going to be covering a true legend in the cryptid community. One of the top three most recognizable cryptids, El Chupacabra. From humble beginnings on a small Caribbean island, to mass terror across North and South America, I'm going to be covering it all. On the small Caribbean island of Puerto Rico, in March of 1995, in the municipalities of Morovis and Orocovis, several farmers found their livestock dead under mysterious circumstances. This included having three puncture marks in their chests and their bodies appearing to be completely drained of blood with no other injuries or any parts eaten. The livestock included dead sheep and goats. News of the strange deaths would slowly start spreading from neighbor telling neighbor, and eventually the newspaper started picking up on it and reporting across Puerto Rico these strange livestock deaths. And while nobody at the time could figure out what was going on, it was assumed that some kind of monster might be responsible. Around the time when the first reports of these strange deaths were coming in, a comedian by the name of Silvero Perez had coined the term El Chupacabra, which is Spanish for goat sucker, on account of some of its first victims being goats. The killings continued into August of 1995, where in the municipality of Canovanis, you had about 150 animals die under the same mysterious circumstances as the first set of animals, puncture marks in their chests and their bodies appearing to be drained of blood. And it wasn't until about six months after the first set of mysterious killings happened where somebody finally got a look at the chupacabra. In September of 1995, Madeline Tolentino spotted the creature in the town of Canovanis. Not only is her sighting the first of El Chupacabra and the most famous, but it's also a very detailed description. Tolentino says that she saw a creature standing on two legs with large black eyes that started in the front and kind of wrapped towards the side, kind of like big alien eyes. She said the creature had no nose or ears, but it did have two holes in its face that we assume was for breathing. It had long, thin arms and thin legs with three clawed fingers on each hand and three clawed toes on each foot. The feet were also apparently webbed and there were spikes or feathers kind of running down its back. Tolentino also mentions the creature did not have any genitalia, which, you know, if I'm faced with a strange looking monstrosity, the last place I'm going to be looking is towards its genitals, but hey, to each their own. Madeline screamed when she saw the monster, which caused her mother to come out of the house, see the monster as well, and then for some reason give chase as the monster started to run away. Madeline's mother wasn't able to keep up with the creature, but apparently a small boy, who saw everything going on, continued the chase, chasing the creature into the woods where he apparently got a hold of it before it broke free and escaped into the darkness. Pretty badass for that kid to just grab something weird, some kind of strange monstrosity. I mean, I'm surprised it didn't try to kill him or drink his blood. Madeline claimed that the creature had left behind slime on some of its victims. And she said that she collected this slime and sent it off to get analyzed. And when the results came back, nothing conclusive was able to be determined from this slime. Her sighting and encounter with the creature became nationwide news in Puerto Rico. Before her sighting, the creature was just a rumor. A sketch was made from her description, a very famous sketch. And with this sketch and her account of the monster, the news about the monster just exploded across the island. There was now a face to the strange killings. Moving on to November of 1995, where in Caguas, PR, apparently the chupacabra had broken into a home through a window and attacked a teddy bear, tore it apart, and then made its escape after committing the vandalism, leaving behind some slime and apparently some rotten meat, out of all things, none of which were, unfortunately, analyzed by professionals. And apparently the woman that owned the home had, soon after the creature left, cleaned up the mess it left behind. December of 1995 was a very eventful month, with multiple people claiming to have seen the chupacabra, and also multiple livestock being found dead, apparently drained of blood with strange puncture marks in their bodies. 
Dead animals continued to pile up, and eyewitness sightings continued throughout into early 1996. With all the sightings, there were several different variations of the description of the chupacabra, and I'd like to get into those. The majority of witnesses described a creature that stood three to five feet in height. It had a humanoid shape with a reptile-like appearance for the most part. You did have a couple people say it had a monkey-like appearance. It was a bipedal creature that most of the time is described doing walking or running. However, at times, some described it hopping like a kangaroo. Its body was leathery or scaly, depending on the witness with usually some kind of greenish, grayish coloration. Some described grayish or black fur, and others described black plumage, like a bird. Sharp spines were usually described traveling down its back, and sometimes down a tail as well, though most sightings that I read about describe no tail at all. The creature usually had a round head with eyes that were described either black, red, orange, yellow, or glowing beams of light, kind of like it had flashlights in its skull. One man did describe getting a portrait look at the creature, describing it having some kind of ugly wolf-like muzzle with pointed ears, though most descriptions describe no ears. Plenty of the witnesses have also described seeing fangs coming out of its mouth with long claws, usually three clawed fingers on each hand. Um, some witnesses also described webbed clawed hands, like it's some kind of fish creature. And if you recall from Madeline's description, she said it, she thought she saw webbed feet. So who knows? Maybe El Chupacabra is an amphibian. Some also described wings on the creature. Either small wings that probably couldn't do anything, or large wings that could maybe actually do with some flight. Another man had described it having membranes connecting its arms and legs that it could probably use for gliding, kind of like a... Flying Squirrel, for example, though most descriptions I read about don't mention any wings. As eyewitness sightings continued, you had some witnesses report strange behaviors about the creature. For example, one person mentioned that it had some kind of color-changing ability like a chameleon. The person reported seeing its skin change from a grayish to a purplish to an orange. You had another woman, a housewife, claimed that she thought the creature could have understood Spanish because apparently when she encountered it and locked eyes with the creature, she called it a sorry excuse for a creature and then called it a pendejo. And apparently this chupacabra, being all offended, backed away, covered itself with its wings, and hid behind some stuff. Kind of, kind of funny, if you ask me. According to one farmer named Raphael, the chupacabra apparently had intimate interests in cattle. Blood's not the only thing it's sucking. Another witness, named Miguel Augusto, described seeing the chupacabra attack a dog, where the chupacabra had apparently shaved a part of the dog where it wanted to feed from, and the chupacabra apparently did this with a razor and some shaving cream. Really, really strange behavior to observe. Also, Miguel was the then-husband of previously mentioned Madeline. As the killings continued and fear spread, you had mobs of farmers, ranchers, and regular civilians forming to hunt for the chupacabra, and none of them ended up being successful in their hunts. But they just mostly wanted to protect their livestock, and more and more people were growing scared that perhaps the next victim will be an actual person. And then you had some people that kind of just thought the whole chupacabra thing was a joke. Probably more so people who weren't having their livestock killed. When you think about it, farmers with livestock, I mean, that, that is an investment. That is future money, a money maker, or something that you're going to nurture and grow and then sell it off for a great profit. And it kind of sucks when it ends up dead. Many people wanted the government or police to do some kind of investigation to afford some kind of protection for people, for farmers, for their livestock. But unfortunately for them, the government and police didn't really have too much to go on their words, not mine. So they didn't really do much in terms of formal investigating or really sending out patrols. Everything was kind of up to the people themselves. You also had the mayor at the time of San Juan, Jose Soto, use the chupacabra to boost his political career. He would go around with 
chupacabra hunting posses and talk about how he would protect the people and it was kind of just a guy walking around with a bunch of armed guards and he was talking about how he would bring the chupacabra to an end and help protect the people I mean, he was kind of doing this around an election time he wanted to remain mayor of san juan um, he had the nickname of chemo and a lot of people started calling him chemo jones like indiana jones the dude seemed to really love the cameras and all the press he was getting from this whole stunt by march of 1996 the terror had spread beyond the island of puerto rico to new territories this included several South American countries, Mexico, and parts of the U.S. May of 1996, all across Mexico, there were multiple reports of people finding their livestock dead with strange puncture marks and completely drained of blood. And then you had a couple instances where some people were describing a large bat-like creature leaving the scene of areas where multiple livestock were found dead. In August of 2000, in Malpaisilo, Nicaragua, multiple farmers were reporting their livestock being killed and drained of blood by some strange creature. So you had a farmer named Jorge Talavera and one of his farmer friends decide to patrol their properties at night to try to ensure that the rest of their livestock survive. Everything was going great, the night was quiet, nothing was going on, up until they heard one of the goats in distress. The two farmers ran to where the goat was, and from a distance in the darkness, they made out three strange creatures attacking a goat. Apparently, these creatures were standing on their hind legs as they attacked. The farmers described these creatures as having leathery, hairless bodies with a ridge going across their backs, having bull-like faces, with two of the creatures being black in color and one of the creatures being yellow. Both farmers took aim and fired from a distance, but they only managed to apparently injure one of these creatures. They decided not to pursue the creatures in the darkness for fear of being attacked or ambushed. It was very dangerous, seeing as you couldn't really see anything. So the following morning, they went out and had a look, but they couldn't find anything. No blood, no footprints, nothing that could indicate what direction this potentially injured chupacabra could have gone. A few days later, a farmhand working for Jorge was out when he saw some vultures circling an area. He decided to investigate the area where he found a partially skeletalized body of some creature. It was very obvious that this creature was already fed upon by scavengers, but apparently he was able to determine that it looked like some kind of hairless dog creature with yellow skin. He took the body back to Jorge, where Jorge claimed that this looked a lot like one of the creatures that he shot, and he assumed that this must have been the one that escaped, crawled somewhere, and just died from its injuries. He did have the body sent to the University of Nicaragua for examination. After several days and several experts looked at the body, they came to the de determination that it was just the body of a dog. They based this off of several of the vertebrae, leg bones, and the skull of the animal. And when they had gone to return the body back to Jorge, Jorge didn't accept the body back, claiming that the scientists had tampered with the body and that they had switched it with the skeleton of a dog and that the creature that he gave them, they were keeping for some reason and trying to hide it, sweep it under the rug. Who doesn't like a good conspiracy or cover up? In 2002, in the West Mesa area just outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, a guy was out walking when he found a strange dead creature in the rocks and sand. It looked like it had been sitting there for a while, all dried out by the sun. It had small wing-like appendages, a pointed head, and a long tail. He didn't know what to make of it, so he took it with him, and doing his own little research, he came to the conclusion that maybe it's the legendary Chupacabra. Many years later, the creature was examined, and it was determined to be an aquatic type creature called a skate, similar to stingrays. It was speculated that maybe somebody caught it in the Gulf of Mexico and then took whatever parts they wanted from the creature to eat and then kind of just dumped its body. My only thing is uh, West Mesa is pretty far from the Gulf of Mexico. 
So I'd like to think that maybe somebody got it from a fish market nearby and then maybe just either dropped the body or got rid of it after, I don't know, eating whatever part they wanted. I don't know, what do you even eat on a skate? Next we have in 2004 in Elmendorf, Texas, a rancher named Devin McGannelly was out walking across his property when he saw a strange creature he had never seen before. He wondered if that strange creature had been the one attacking his livestock over the last couple of days. So, like any good Texan, he grabbed his gun and he shot and killed the creature. Upon close examination, the creature looked dog-like, with a wrinkly grayish skin, almost entirely hairless, a rat-like snout with its incisors kind of just sticking out of its mouth. He had the body examined, and he had DNA sent out to be tested to the University of New York. DNA examinations concluded that most likely this creature was just a dog suffering from very severe mange. Mange being a skin disease caused by mites that burrow into the skin. It causes a lot of itching. The animals start biting at their skin to try to quell the itching. It can cause hair to fall out, and then in the really bad cases, the skin can get really thick and leathery, and overall the animals suffer. In July of 2007, in Quero, Texas, they had a rancher named Phyllis Canyon. She had several of her animals for many years preyed upon by a mysterious creature. She would claim that she would come home and find things like her chickens just dead, laying about, completely drained of blood. She found this very strange because as far as she was aware, any predators in the area wouldn't just kill her animals, they would kill them and then either take them or at least eat them. To her, the animals just appeared to be drained of blood and that was that. Then, one day in July, one of Phyllis's neighbors called her and said that there was a strange dead animal by the side of the road at this neighbor's property. Phyllis went out and examined the creature and it looked like some kind of dog-like creature with bluish gray skin, completely hairless. And while she was examining this creature, another one of her neighbors called her and said, hey, there's another dead strange creature, except it's right in front of your house. So she took the first body, went back to her property, and examined the second body. She ended up having one of the creatures stuffed, and the other one she kept in a freezer, which she would later have DNA tested by four separate places. And according to her, none of the DNA came back matching any known animal. She would later become known as the Chupacabra Lady. Moving on to July of 2009 in Blanco, Texas, a man was having several of his chickens killed every night by a strange intruder. So he decided to leave some poison out around his chicken coop, hoping the intruder would eat the poison and die. And that's exactly what happened. The following morning after putting out the poison, he found a strange dead creature by his chicken coop. He took the body to a friend named Jerry Ayer, who was apparently a taxidermist. He had this creature taxidermied, and a lot of people would describe it as looking like a coyote or dog or even a Mexican hairless dog. The body was never DNA tested, but the general consensus is it was some kind of canine suffering from mange. Less than a year later, in January of 2010, in Horizon City, Texas, a man named Cesar Garcia had 20 of his chickens killed in their coop in one night. Caesar found it strange that, despite all the dead chickens, there was a lack of blood in the coop. He never claimed that the chickens were drained of blood, he just found it strange that there wasn't a big bloody mess everywhere, despite all the dead chickens. The following night, he had ten more chickens get killed, but unfortunately, no culprit was ever caught. Caesar did some research and came to the conclusion that it was probably El Chupacabra that killed his chickens. These were just some uh, accounts of potential chupacabra attacks or sightings that happened in parts of Latin America, Mexico, and the U.S. that I felt were the most interesting, so I wanted to talk about them. And in reading all the accounts throughout areas outside of Puerto Rico, the general description of a chupacabra in these areas is a canine-like creature, mostly hairless or completely hairless, wrinkly, leathery skin, that was grayish, claws, fangs, and running around on all fours. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with the chupacabra, 
talking about several sightings and accounts from Puerto Rico to across other areas, we're going to get into some theories that could potentially explain what it was and how it came to be. The first theory we're going to discuss is mass hysteria. You see, as news spread of the chupacabra to new areas, suddenly these areas started reporting chupacabra sightings and, in general, anything weird started becoming related to the chupacabra. And more and more of the stories being reported in the news, particularly in Puerto Rico, were getting more and more ridiculous. If you recall, I mentioned things like the chupacabra apparently shaving a dog to feed from it, and the one lady who says that she claims it knew Spanish and kind of just backed away slowly from her when she insulted it, even though I feel like a bloodthirsty, ravenous creature would sooner attack you than stop and back away. I even read one report where a woman got scared by something and fell and claimed that the chupacabra attacked her and busted up her leg, even though there was no evidence of this, and she was probably startled by a bird flying through some brush. Her injuries were consisted of falling and getting hurt and not really being attacked by anything. And again, if a bloodthirsty creature is going to attack you, I doubt it'll just scratch up your leg and leave. You're talking about a creature that's described as killing as many as 20 to 30 animals a night and leaving them there empty of blood. You really think it's going to stop at scaring you? The next theory involves the chupacabra just being a bunch of known canines whether that be coyotes, Mexican wolf, or feral dogs. When we look at the bodies that were recovered and DNA tested, specifically outside of Puerto Rico, they almost always come back as some kind of coyote or dog suffering from mange, minus the one skate that was found. We don't talk about the skate. Canines suffering from mange tend to be in a weakened state, and are kind of basically suffering the entire time. They're always constantly itchy, they've been chewing at their skin, they might have wounds. You know, I mean, your skin's kind of thickening over. It's very uncomfortable, not exactly a way for you to be in top shape to be out hunting properly. So a lot of the times, these sick and weak animals, predatory animals, tend to go after livestock because they're pretty easy to take down. If you get into a goat pen, they can't exactly go far. They're kind of stuck in the pen makes them easy targets. But if livestock are easy prey, then why not eat them? Well, dogs and coyotes have been recorded killing but not consuming their prey. And this could be due to several factors. Illness, maybe some kind of injury, or maybe they fail to get the initial kill. And because they're in this mangy weakened state, they kind of don't have the energy to continue pursuing the prey. These animals, once they're attacked, could then die from internal bleeding or shock after the predator has already left. So you could be left with a dead animal with a bite mark, perhaps some punctures, uneaten, and you're sitting there scratching your head as to what could have killed my animals. Feral dogs and coyotes can instinctually just kind of go for the throat when they approach a prey animal. You're talking about a bite that creates punctures and will do things like crush the trachea of the animal, causing it to suffocate, and it can also cause minimal bleeding. And there have been, again, recorded cases where dogs and coyotes would just kind of get into this little frenzy and just massacre a bunch of animals in one go, but not actually eat any of them. And if you're just going from goat to goat or sheep to sheep or what have you, just biting them in the neck and letting go, these animals are just dropping dead from suffocation or internal bleeding. It's going to look really strange for the people who find the bodies in the morning. Many would assume that if a dog or coyote attacks an animal, it'd probably rip them apart, but that doesn't seem to be true in most cases. Everything that I've read, they tend to just try to bring down the animal quickly. Quick bite to the neck doesn't really cause too much damage, and again, you get these little puncture marks in whichever body part they decided to bite. Some of the bodies that were found did have parts missing, either genitalia or maybe one part was opened up and certain organs were taken. This is something that dogs or coyotes would do. They don't always consume the entire body. And a lot of the news stuff doesn't report every specific detail because the big important detail was, hey, your animal's dead, 
puncture wounds and drained of blood. Really sells the newspapers when it's that mysterious and you just overlook some of the details. And again, I mentioned before, livestock deaths happen all the time. And it's generally not something that you kind of find strange as a farmer or rancher. But when you have a couple more mysterious things happen and say the farmer rancher doesn't fully understand all of the things, and then the news picks it up, it can kind of spiral into this whole mess of a monster hunt when in reality it might just be dogs. Now that we got through the boring theories, we can get into the fun ones. Starting with, was the chupacabra an alien? Perhaps it was a forgotten pet, some greys or reptilians visiting, maybe took it out for a walk and forgot where they tied it up, or maybe it just escaped the ship as they were leaving. Or maybe the chupacabra perhaps was a intelligent creature in and of itself visiting Earth to study us. Perhaps it chose Puerto Rico because it was a small contained island and the tropical climate maybe reminded it of its home. There were UFO sightings that happened during, after, and before the chupacabra sightings began. So perhaps they're somehow related. Granted, I find it a little hard to believe that coincidentally the chupacabra is able to survive in our atmosphere and it has a food source like whatever perhaps animals it's preying upon on its home world. I don't know. The whole alien thing never really stuck with me. But what does kind of make sense to me is could the chupacabra have been a government experiment? Perhaps the chupacabra was some kind of genetic experiment and either the US government created it from scratch or it spliced together multiple different creatures to create it. Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the US and not an actual state and perhaps maybe doing certain kind of research in Puerto Rico could avoid maybe certain oversight or regulations that you'd have to follow if you say maybe conducted certain secret experiments in the U.S. itself. Granted, if it's the U.S. government conducting it, I'm pretty sure it'd be easy to cover it up, regardless if you were doing it in the States or if you were doing it on an island that wasn't part of the States, technically. Perhaps this bioweapon escaped, and throughout its several months of terror across Puerto Rico, maybe the U.S. government is trying to recapture it. If you think about it, it would kind of make sense. Puerto Rico is a small island that's densely populated, so it would kind of be hard for a larger creature to remain hidden the entire time on the island. At least if it was an active population where you had breeding pairs and offspring, that kind of thing. If it was an escaped government experiment and there was only one of them, then perhaps that, that would explain why it was never properly discovered. And the U.S. government could have also created some of the mass hysteria by maybe sending in operatives to kill certain animals and stage chupacabra killings in one area, make everyone focus on that area while they wrangled it in another spot, captured it, and then perhaps relocated it off of Puerto Rico, or maybe even just terminated it after. Maybe it was just too much of a hassle. Puerto Rico, after all, is no stranger to escaped experiments. One of the islands off the coast of Puerto Rico houses monkeys for research and experiment purposes. They're rhesus monkeys. They're not native to the area and they were brought there on purpose. And after so many years, some of the monkeys managed to escape through boats and get onto the mainland of Puerto Rico. And to this day, there is still an existing, albeit a small population, of monkeys that are non-native hanging out in Puerto Rico. So who's to say that a genetic experiment like a chupacabra couldn't escape some kind of research facility and then wreak havoc across the island before it was brought back? Or maybe they never caught it. Maybe it was aquatic, like how some described, and maybe it managed to escape the island by swimming off of it. Maybe that's how it got to the rest of the U.S. or Mexico or South America. Who knows? Theories are always fun, though. So let's talk discrepancies, because unfortunately we are going to have to puncture some holes in the Chupacabra legend. See what I did there? Terrible jokes aside, let's start with were the animals actually drained of blood? A common trope among the legend and all the victims that they were allegedly drained of blood. 
when it came to actually examining the dead animals by veterinarians who knew what they were doing, it was found that every animal examined still had all of its blood, or most of its blood, minus getting the actual initial injury that probably bled somewhat. As for all the other animals, they were never examined, and it was more just farmers saying they were drained of blood because that's how it appeared. There is an explanation as to how the animals could appear as if they've been drained. You see, when the heart stops and the animal's lying there dead, all the blood tends to flow downwards with the force of gravity and settle in whichever end of the body is essentially below the puncture hole made in the animal. As the blood sits there and settles, it kind of turns into a jelly, not so much a liquid, like blood normally is when it flows through your veins. And because of that, you could turn the animal around, move the animal around, squeeze the animal, but no blood is going to shoot out of it. And it'll make the animal appear as if it's bloodless. Remember the Nicaraguan farmer I mentioned, who apparently shot one of the chupacabras when three of them were trying to attack one of his goats? Well, his animals were never examined, so it was never confirmed that they were actually drained of blood. On top of that, the body that was found that he claimed looked like the one he shot he admitted in a later interview that it was just a dog. A strange looking dog, but to him it looked like it was just a dog, not really a legendary chupacabra. His whole eyewitness account has been called into question just because it was dark, you couldn't really see much, and he was looking at it from a distance. On top of that, he wasn't really sure if he was seeing two or three animals. And the details he gave, like the ridge you could see on its back, or it looking like some hairless dog, at that distance in the dark, who knows what he actually saw, and he's even said that he's unsure if he saw what he saw. If you recall, another man named Caesar, who had said that 20 of his chickens were killed in the chicken coop, he made a comment saying it was strange that there was a lack of blood in the chicken coop because of all the dead chickens. He never claimed that the animals were drained of blood, and in fact he did have the animals examined and they were all still very much full of blood. And then there was Phyllis, the chupacabra lady from Texas. If you recall, she also had several of her livestock killed, though she never had any of them actually properly examined by a vet. On top of that, if you recall, she said that she had her DNA sample from one of the bodies sent off and tested at four different places, and they all came back inconclusive. Well, that actually wasn't true. The DNA results came back saying that the creature was a coyote, probably suffering from severe mange, hence its appearance. And there might have been some Mexican wolf mixed in there too, but not some legendary creature. Granted, Phyllis still likes to believe that she has a stuffed mount of the legendary chupacabra, and you know what, I can't blame her. It looks really weird and it looks really cool, and honestly, it's a great conversation piece to have in your living room. And I know I mentioned the Nicaraguan farmer having a poor eyewitness account, but overall, in general, whether it was in Puerto Rico or in Texas or anywhere else, the eyewitness accounts weren't all that reliable. They were often at night, somewhat of a distance, the person was already frightened, and especially at the height of chupacabra fever, people were generally scared to be out, and if they saw anything weird, they kind of freaked out and their mind kind of made up details at times as the sighting occurred. So it's kind of hard to really find any of the eyewitnesses credible. Speaking of eyewitnesses, there was Madeline Tolentino, the one who had the most famous chupacabra sighting, a very detailed and also the very first. How credible was she? Well, apparently her sighting was influenced by the movie Species, which had come out about a month before she had her famous sighting. She even said it herself that the alien human hybrid thing in the movie Species looked a lot like her chupacabra sighting. And comparing the two side by side, I can see some similarities and maybe how she could have pulled some of the details from the movie, but she herself has admitted to believing that what she saw in the movie was happening in real life in front of her, which kind of messes up the whole sighting in general. You have the sketch, sure, but, you know, did it really have spikes? Did it really look like she claimed it looked based on the drawing, it's kind of impossible to say. Aside from the movie creature probably muddying up her eyewitness account, her whole description was called into question for other reasons. This included how detailed it was. 
you know, she admitted to being scared when she saw the creature, and yet she gave such a description as if she was able to look at the creature, get up close to it, have a whole 360 look at it. And on top of the strangely detailed description, she also changed her story multiple times. She had originally said that it was this three-clawed monster on each hand, and later she changed it to it having five fingers instead of three, and she said it was more human-like. Also, she said that originally it ran away from her, but then that evolved into it hopped away from her, which fits some other eyewitness accounts who claim that it hopped like a kangaroo. But then she changed her story again, saying that it didn't hop, this thing was floating. And once again, in a 2010 interview, she also changed up her story again, this time claiming her mother was the one who first saw the creature, and there was no little boy that chased the creature after or managed to catch the creature for a brief moment. That just never happened. Which, initially reading the account, before finding out this information, I often wondered why didn't anybody interview the boy, who was the boy, who the hell just chases down a strange creature and tries to grab it. So this kind of makes sense that it was just a made-up detail. Granted, why would she make up such a detail? And it generally makes you wonder if she really had a genuine sighting, if she just saw something weird and the movie affected her description, or maybe she was just trying to get some attention. I'm not sure. We just know at the end of the day, nobody could really verify her story or her mother from what she witnessed. And of course, there was the slime that Madeline said that she collected from a victim and sent off to get tested and with it coming back inconclusive. Well, unfortunately, you guessed that that was also a lie. There was no slime, nothing was collected, nothing was sent off. She claimed to have sent it to a woman in Pennsylvania. When that woman was tracked down and questioned, she said that she never got anything from this woman, never tested any slime. Which, you know, maybe it's part of a government cover-up and she's just saying that. Or, you know, most likely it was just entirely made up. Madeline, overall, is, seems to be pretty questionable. Her famous sighting seems to be just a lot of crap. In my opinion, of course. And here we are again at the conclusion. From everything I've gathered, I want to say you can't fully disprove the chupacabra, but a lot of the information points to it being not really a real creature. Um, in my personal opinion, anything outside of Puerto Rico was just mass hysteria and misidentifications. I think that can be said with certainty. I think the only creature that ever existed stayed in Puerto Rico and, you know, I can easily say it probably wasn't real either, but I like to go with the fun theory that it was a government experiment, it managed to escape, and while all the scariness was happening in Puerto Rico, the U.S. government maybe managed to corral it into one area and capture it. Maybe they got it off the island, maybe they took it to Area 51, who knows? I just don't think it got off of Puerto Rico and then caused havoc in other lands. And some of you more informed may have wondered, why didn't I mention El Vampiro de Mocha, the Vampire of Mocha? Well, I was going to include it in this video, right in the beginning, since the Mocha Vampire stuff happened several years before the first officially considered Chupacabra attack. I kind of dove into a whole rabbit hole, found a bunch of interesting information, and I figured it would be best suited for a mystery video instead of a cryptid video. And it can definitely be its own separate phenomenon. I mean, it was its own separate phenomenon that happened. So look forward to that in the future once I get through another true horror, paranormal, and another alien video. Then we'll get to that one. So it will be covered. Um, if you're new to the channel and you made it this far, maybe subscribe. It helps me out and, you know, you'll stay informed when new videos drop. And also like the video if you enjoyed it. Dislike it if you didn't. Uh, I don't sweat it. It's fine. And uh, I'd very much like to know in the comments down below what you thought of the Chupacabra. Do you have your own theories? Did you learn anything new? Um, I know there's a lot of information already out in the Chupacabra, and I just tried to gather as much information that is both known and potentially unknown, and hopefully explained it in a fun way. But anyway, until next time, don't hang around any goats, 
and I'll see you around. Thank you.